This Week in Startups is brought to you by IBM, dedicated to supporting startups and developers by building developer communities in cities all over the world and providing support, connections, and opportunities to grow. Learn more at developer.ibm.com slash startups. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. When a new technology emerges, like blockchain or cryptocurrency, there's an opportunity to take that technology and apply it to all kinds of verticals and see if we can make the world a little bit better and perhaps build a lasting enterprise, a business, a growing concern that makes revenue. Now, we are in the middle of a cryptocurrency and ICO boom. People are going crazy about it. Is it a tulip mania type situation or a dot-com era style mania? Well, I think it's a dot-com style era mania, which is to say it's based on something very real, a real technology in this case, cryptocurrency, blockchain, ICOs, all very real technology that has something to offer humanity. But as the case is in the dot-com era, overhyped and early. I have been very cautious in this space and not made many investments at all. But one company I did invest in is called Aid Tech. And Aid Tech is led by Niall Dennehy, and he is with me today. They're currently in the launch incubator as part of the Great Eight. Sometimes we do the Magnificent Seven, seven companies per incubator class. Other times we do the Great Eight. Uh, in this case, we had eight people come to the incubator. At the incubator, the companies uh, come for 12 weeks, they do 20 sessions, and they meet and they pitch to over 250 investors. That's right, every week, starting in the beginning, maybe five a week, then 15 a week, and then in the later weeks, even 100 in one week. We do this because if the company is able to pitch 250 of the greatest investors and syndicate members in the world, and they can't raise money, it tells us something. And as you know, we accept only companies in our Goldilocks zone, the GLZ, not the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, the GLZ, the Goldilocks zone. What is the Goldilocks zone for Jason Calacanis and the Launch Incubator? It means your products in the market, you have some traction, but not so much traction that you've closed your Series A or Series B and you don't need uh, any uh, help from us. We want to be able to be helpful to the companies. We want to be the most helpful incubator to the companies. And that's why we selected ATEC to be part of the launch incubator in 2017. They won IBM Smart Camp. Is that right? You won IBM Smart we Camp. Did. We yeah. did. So welcome to the program, Niall, uh, the winner of IBM Smart Camp at the Launch Festival, which then entitled you to come to the incubator. And you've been coming to the incubator now for, I think, nine or 10 weeks. All the way from Dublin, Ireland. All the way. So you're commuting. We are. It's small the thing. second longest commute we've ever had. What's the longest? Hong Kong. Wow. Yeah. We're looking for a company from Dubai <laughs> or Thailand <laughs> to bre- or, India <laughs> or India to break the record. But I think that you have the second. Uh, but uh, tell uh, everybody, what is aid tech? Yeah, glad and why did you create it? I'm delighted to get on the show, Jason. I'm a super fan. Have been for a long time. I know you are. Um, so, and can, you are genuinely super. I you genuinely email am. me and tell me about specific episodes. <laughs> I appreciate that. I know episodes off there. I can tell you my favorite episode is 640 when you had Steve Case on, and he was a big inspiration for ATEC and what we're doing. What um, did you? What was it about uh, 640, uh, Steve Case, that you liked? Uh, Steve Case, well, I think uh, when you look at the book that Steve wrote, the, uh, the third wave, as he called it, we believe that we are in the third wave, and we believe we are a startup that embodies what the third wave is and better. Than what is the third wave in his mind? Define that if you can. Yes. Yeah, so so the third wave is companies who are getting out there. They're in the real world. They're doing big things. Um, it, it, it's not. Re- it's something that um, we have a technology which we're harnessing now, and we believe it can achieve great things um, in the real world. In, in the real like world, Airbnb or exactly. Uber like or Airbnb, Tesla Uber. or SpaceX. Yeah. These are physical, real products, not just yeah. software. And it's not an easy problem that we're trying to solve. It's going to take a bit of time, but we are doing it right now. And even my co-founder, Joe, for example, is in New York today. He's been named a, an SDG pioneer by the United Nations, one of only 10 people, and he's been given the accolade of SDG pioneer for blockchain That's, technology. What is that, like strategic developmental goals? It the is UN? The, yeah, it's the sustainable, right? sustainable, sustainable development goals. Yeah. It's a fancy word for priorities yeah. at the United Nations. Uh, we, we think it's the world's toughest to-do list, huh. and it's 17 goals set by 193 
countries backed by the United 17 Nations. 17 goals. Some 17. of those goals include? Some of them would be, for example, Target 16, and there is a sub-target then called Target 16.9. And Target 16.9 is to bring legal identity to everybody on the planet by the year 2030. We are speeding that up by 13 years, and the UN have just recognized that this week. We're even up on a billboard in Times Square. My co-founder, Joe. All right. So tell us, what does a tech do? Because we're, we're starting yeah. to dance around it, but I like yeah. to always ask the founder explicitly to answer this question. Yeah. What does a tech do? So what we do is we are using digital identity based on blockchain technology to reduce fraud and corruption. So to give you a bit of context, Jason, uh, $4.4 trillion is lost each year because of fraud, corruption, and lack of transparency. What we have done is we have created a digital identity which is based on blockchain. And with this, then we are distributing services like welfare, remittances, aid, and donations completely transparently with the blockchain as the foundation and digital identity as the receiving mechanism. Right. So here we have it, an aid tech digital ID card with a QR yeah. code on it. Exactly. So when we met, you were working with uh, refugees yeah. that were literally landing in Europe uh, on certain yeah. coastlines. Is that correct? That's correct. And the, the really the genesis of the idea, and if you let me tell a quick story, Jason, Please. it all goes back to my co-founder, Joe, and I'm going to talk about him a lot today because he is the inspiration behind aid tech. But it goes back to 2009, and Joe ran a marathon called the Marathon de Sabla back in 2009, which is a 151-mile race through the Moroccan desert. It is known as the toughest foot race in the world. We like to think that it really embodies what ATEC is. But to give you an idea of what happened during that marathon, on day two, Joe collapsed. We gave him some Gatorade. On day three, he collapsed. We gave him some Guinness. He got back up. He did it. Day four mm. was a 78-mile race. He finished it. Literally, he had to stay ahead of a camel. So one of the Bedouins was holding, uh, bringing a camel along. And the only the yardstick was that you've got to stay ahead of the camel to finish the race. But to bring it back to, to make it more relevant, essentially what happened was Joe raised a huge amount of money. One of the donors who gave him money, this was in the depths of the recession in 2009 in Ireland, in the Great Recession. He, uh, went, Joe raised a big sum of money and he asked Joe uh, about six months later, where did my money go? Mm. Joe wasn't ga able to give him an answer. So Joe had an idea then that why not look into blockchain technology to solve the problem? He was w working on a thesis and a guy who was wor uh, sh looking at his thesis ran a charity where people cycle from Dublin, Ireland, all the way to Belarus to support children who um, were affected by the nuclear disaster there. And a lot of people were using crypto at the time to do things... Um, yeah, like Bitcoin was the main example, but we had this idea going back to the experience in the desert that if we could bring traceability to international aid, hence the name ATEC, we could actually do something really big with crypto. So if I donate $1,000 to somebody running one of these races and it, it's going to go to refugees or it's going to go to, uh, you know, uh, mosquito nets, I have no idea what gets there or not. Yeah. With your technology, it's super fascinating. People... Every time they spend money with their ID card or their donation card or like a, what, like a gift card, I guess, it tracks what was given to them. So if a pound of rice was given to a refugee and you know some toothpaste and whatever it is, I would be able to see on the blockchain that this person who didn't have an identity now has an identity. They use their identity with a biometric, perhaps, a picture to spend the money I gave on something and I got a result back. Yeah giving me confidence that my donation to the Red Cross, to Houston victims, actually made it somewhere, and I can see what that something was. You've hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what it is. And to give you an example of uh, what you can do with our technologies, if you make a donation, let's say you make a donation to the International Federation of the Red Cross, what you can do is you can trace that donation down to the level of an individual cent. So for example, if Jason gives $10 to the International Federation of the Red Cross, you can get an alert on your mobile phone telling you that your donation has been spent in country X by person Y for Z and what the amount was. You can trace Amazing. it down to the level of the individual cent. But the real, the key thing for us is that we have the partners to make it happen. We're, mm. We've signed a partnership agreement with the International Federation of the Red Cross in Geneva, the United Nations Development Program, and we've got a huge amount of partners and they are our distribution channel to get our technology out there. And then for us, we bring these efficiencies to governments like mm -hmm. the government of Ireland, like the government of Armenia, like the government of Serbia. We're working on a big project with them at the moment. And the whole mission is to bring social and financial inclusion to the world's undocumented and underserved population. Why, why are people undocumented at this point? I'm curious, 
what, don't doesn't every country have some sort of show me your papers? I you need to have a driver's license. You need to have a passport. What? Why are countries? Why haven't they solved this already? It seems madness to me that in 2017 that everybody doesn't have something like a driver's license or an ID card. Yeah, and you'd be surprised. In the developed world, everybody does. But in the developing world, it's something that a lot of people, when they're born, they have no legal identity. And the legal identity, as per that goal that I spoke about with Target 16.9, uh, that is the key to unlocking a lot of the... Uh, well, why haven't they gotten to it? Why haven't governments gotten to it? Is it just not a priority? It's not a priority, yeah. For a lot of governments, it's something that they haven't focused on. And again, oftentimes, it's because they haven't got the technology in place to do it. Mm. But with blockchain, uh, it's enabled a lot of countries to leapfrog in much the same way that mobile broadband did in Africa. So ah, without having the cables in the ground, you can now bypass um, with blockchain what you would have done in the past. It makes it, it's a lightweight infrastructure that you can issue legal identities really quickly and efficiently. So yeah, our ID cards, our passports here in America or in Ireland aren't on the blockchain by default. And our identities are not digital, essentially. They're, they can be digitized, but they're not... Yeah a primarily digital identity that exists in cyberspace and, and our transactions don't exist on that blockchain. So these folks are going to be yeah. like people using M-Pesa and other technologies. They literally never owned a desktop computer and they're never exactly. going to own a credit card. They're just going to own virtual currency yeah. and have digital identity. How do you make money? I don't invest in charities. I invest in businesses. I do give to charities, mm -hmm. but you're an investment of mine. You're a for-profit company that makes what, that we know the what you make, but we don't know who you sell it to and how you price it. So explain how you price it and who buys it. Does, sure. the, does the individual consumer pay a dollar a month to have an identity? Does the UN pay for this? Who's paying for your software? Yeah, sure. And it's a great question. Uh, for us, we do not charge the person using the technology, but our business model is we charge a fee per user per month. It's $1, but the paying customer for our digital identity is going to be a government. So for example, we work with our partners, the United Nations Development Program, the Red Cross, and what we do is we give them our technology for free, and then they get they get their funding from governments, from philanthropists, people like Bill Gates, the Omidyar Foundation. And again, all down to your great incubator today, Jason, we are going to be meeting with some from the Omidyar Foundation, but essentially, oh, we, fantastic! Yeah, so looking forward to that. But we charge a fee per user per month. It's one dollar. Typically, it can vary depending on the country. But we like to say that as well as a SaaS-based business model, we bring TAS, which is transparency as a service, and that is again the mission of the company. To now bring you have to have a you have to have a country buy into that. They have to want transparency. They want to. They have to want people who disappear to have an identity. As opposed to dictatorships, despots, and horrible people around the world, they might have actually been better served if people were undocumented. Is that not true? It, it it's is a human rights effort as well. It's true to a certain extent, but a lot of uh, the people that we work with, for example, and this is uh, the analogy we like to say is that we are like David piggybacking on the back of Goliath. Yeah. So for example, what ATEC does is we partner with people like mm. the UNDP, and what we do is we piggyback on them and their reputation. They take us into a country. So if we go to a country like Serbia, which we're, we're in right now, rolling out our remittances project. About 9 million people there. Yeah, that's great. And uh, for example, one vertical that we're going into there is remittances, and that's a $2.4 billion What is market. remittances? What is that? A remittance mean? is, it's huge. So remittances is a $452 billion market. What is it? What and is it? it's basically sending money cross border. So got for it. example, if money somebody, transfer, money transfer, if somebody here in San Fran has got a relative back in China, they will typically send a lot of the money that they earn back to China. Um, it could be weekly, it could be monthly. And oftentimes then they are hit with very high fees. And mm. the fees, according to the World Bank, who we have partnered with, are on average 7.32% as of 2016. So the people who can afford least to pay the fees pay the highest. It's exactly what it is. And for example, Welcome we spoke to, with... Uh, it's a dark, it's a dark uh, <laughs> trend in the world. Yeah. So we spoke with the uh, people in Somalia recently, and they told us that 90% of the economy in Somalia is based on remittances, and the fees on average are between 17 and 20%. But what we're doing is in a project that we're kicking off in Serbia with the UN is we are partnering with them, and we are using Stripe as a delivery mechanism, and we are bringing the cost of remittances ah. down. And to go back to the sustainable development goals, another goal of the UN is target 10, and target 10C specifically is to bring the cost of remittances down below 3% by the year 2030. So just what people pay in the United States to, sh to 
whoever, Stripe or Square or PayPal, to do basic um, credit card transactions and deal with fraud and, and have some economic incentive, but not a predatory one. Exactly. So a country like uh, Somalia with a population of about 11 million or just over, uh, about 9 million uh, in Serbia, is your intention to get all of them and have each of those yeah. be a $100 million a year client, which $100 million a year sounds great to me um, as an investor, if you can get a couple of countries to do that. And for the country itself, $100 million, or if you gave them a bulk discount and it was 25 or $50 million, seems like an incredibly affordable way to execute on this. This is going to save them a magnitude, 90%, 50%, I don't know what the number would be, versus making print forgeable passports. Exactly. And going back to Serbia again, with uh, what we're doing there is there is um, just a huge amount of people. The fees are on average about 8% in that country. We're going to bring them below 3% with the project that we're doing. But we have signed an agreement with the UN to bring the same offering to 20 countries mm. within the next few months based on the success of the pilot, which is kicking off very soon. And going back to the business model, what we do as well with that is we take an additional transaction fee on top of the fee per user per month per identity mm. on top of, um, of, of that as well. So that is how we get this recurring revenue stream. But again, it goes back to the mission we're solving, um, bringing social and finan financial inclusion to the world's undocumented and underserved. And again, the governments around the world are seeing that things like remittances, if you can get back more of the remittance, if that can circulate within the economy, that means that you're improving the economy in that country. And you can imagine if you scale that up and you bring these hundreds of millions back into an economy, and if we make money doing it at the same time with our partners, it's a completely win-win situation. It would be for... 4% of additional GDP, if you went from 7 to 3, in a way, yeah. you'd immediately have 4%. Well, no, the entire, the, the entire economy does not go through remittance, but people might be moving money around so often that maybe it does. Who knows how much is sent back and forth? But if you were to lower those fees, the concept would be that that would be a tax break. We have this happen here in the United States when we lower taxes or lower mortgage rates or gasoline becomes cheap. We see people take more vacations, you know, uh, and are able to spend money on, you know, blue jeans and going out to dinner. So this could be amazing for economies in the world to increase consumer spending and increase savings. Completely. Yeah. And what we're doing is because of the nature of the technology, how we've harnessed it by basically taking the code that we've written for the remittances offering, we can replicate that with very little effort for additional verticals. They are things like donations um, that can be welfare and that can be international aid. Mm -hmm. And we're also kicking off another project in Jordan with the United Nations. And we got some funding from the government of Dubai um, as part of Expo 2020. They gave us $100,000 and we are going to be rolling out a project in Jordan with the United Nations to distribute welfare and that will be the biggest delivery of welfare on the blockchain in the year 2017. Great. So talking to you just as a founder and investor and founder to founder, investor to founder, it feels like you're in the finding product market fit and you're such a dynamic group of individuals. It seems like you're able to sell people uh, these great projects, but we have not yet hit a repeatable, scalable process yet. Is that accurate to describe the, the sort of moment in time we're at with ATEC? Yeah, so we, we believe we already have the technology to make it repeatable. We haven't scaled as of yet, but with the partners that we have, it'll mm. probably take us a little bit longer than it would a typical uh, SaaS company with a consumer app, but once... Or a SaaS company with an enterprise app, like yeah. a Slack, yeah. because they can just sell to a massively fragmented market. You're selling to governments in the UN. That makes me scared. What's the sales cycle like and how do you accelerate it? So for us, the sales cycle really is, it is a bit longer than it would be for, you know, an app that you put on an app store and getting in there. But for us to accelerate it is we have to prove that we can actually deliver on that, which we have been doing by developing the, um, the offerings. And we speed it up because of the reputation that we have. Number one, it's been hard earned, hard fought. We are now considered in the world that we inhabit as being the leading company using blockchain technology to solve the problems for these governments. But to speed it up, it's really a lot of hustle, Jason. We get out there, we meet people, uh, we show them what we can do. For example, it's really a sales driven, business development driven company in addition to a technology driven one. Is it not? Is your background in uh, and Joe's in business development sales? Because it, one of the things that's great about this company is I, I see so much activity in terms of these pilots 
that it leads me to believe that one of these pilots will break out at some point. That's but what's, the, what's you and Joe, your, your and Joe's background? Were you, were you in sales and business development? How does that help you? As yeah, a, so Joe is phenomenal. Joe has about four different qualifications. He's got an MBA. He's got a master's in strategic IT. He, it was, he did a digital, um, a master's in digital currency out of the University in Nicosia. I did a degree in information technology, but we have technical backgrounds, but we discovered pretty early that we weren't great at coding. So we, we thought we could talk a little bit better than we could code and business development was something that uh, suited us. But we met working for a telco company. We traveled the world. We, we visited about 33 countries. Ah, so you, got, you, you cut your teeth at that telco company. We did, yeah. Doing BD. Doing BD, a lot of technical training. So mm. we were going out to explaining to engineers how to use really, really cutting edge technology developed by a company called Ericsson. And we both found yeah. out that we were quite good at doing that. And then given what we're doing today now with the technology that we have, which you're pretty well up on it, but it is, it can be quite a bit of, it's something. No, it's, be, it's definitely a ramp up for everybody to understand yeah. what the blockchain is. What is a ledger that is open to everybody and distributed and doesn't exist in one place. It exists in all places or yeah. many places. Yeah. This is a crazy new concept. Um, let's talk a little bit about ICOs. Um, this has been a bit of a craze. I've yeah. looked at the company's ICOing and said, wow, nine out of 10 of these would not get funded by the venture or angel community. The people who've built over the last 40 or 50 years, the greatest companies in the world would not invest in these. Uh, except maybe Vinnie Lingham's looks pretty promising. Filecoin marginally looks interesting. But to see $200 million or $100 million go into some of these companies before they've actually built a product and you are making hundreds of thousands of dollars in pilots and actually have customers and people using it and have mm -hmm. written the code or writing the product, yeah. why have you not done an ICO and taken advantage of this boom? I tell you what, the, the reputation that we have right now has been really hard, hard fought. We've been traveling the world, going back to your point about educating people on what blockchain technology is. For example, we spent time with the International Federation of the Red Cross in Geneva, educating about what blockchain is. But there is a lot of uncertainty around the ICOs at the moment. We're not saying we're not going to do one. We're, we're considering it. And we believe in um, that it's it's really, you can draw parallels between the dot-com um, yeah. bubble burst back in 2000. And a lot of people would have said that a lot of the companies back then were, if you pardon my language, you were dog shit companies. Yeah. But there were some great companies who came out of that. And we think now with the, there's going to be a bit more regulation coming into ICOs. We have a guy on our board who is the former director of the US Mint. We're speaking with him right now and the SEC about potentially doing an ICO. We haven't committed to it yet because if and when we do one, we want to ensure that we check every base possible to ensure that we run the best ICO in the world to date. Right. And because of the partners that we have, if we choose to do it, we believe that we could run the greatest ICO that has been done to date. If Really? Yeah. yeah. See, I think an ICO where you said, we're going to make, this is what I would do. And let me see yeah. what you think. And I'm just an investor, so I can't, I always, as an investor, always present these things as just ideas yeah. that I see from, you know, sitting on the bench, but you're actually in the game, so you have to tell me if you think there's a possibility here. The identity product is uh, something that you currently make money off of. What if you raised money and said, hey, there are this many billion of undocumented people. We're going to try to raise the money to deploy to get this percentage of them documented for free. So if we were to raise a Tezos-like $200 million round, 90% of whatever we raise goes into the digital identity fund to free freely identify people and build that infrastructure for folks. So then nonprofits, whether it's Bill Gates or Pierre uh, or whoever, who, the UN, whoever wants to put money into this can say, you know what? We're putting money in this just to give identity to people. They're not going to make any money off of that. And it's an open identity platform that anybody can use. And then you could say, we're going to reserve 20% of it for our company to then make software to do stuff on top of that identity level. What do you think of that concept? Th that's an intriguing concept, and we have ran through a few. Scenarios. Is that your concept too? Or uh, no? It's, it's very close. We're we're close. currently analyzing very close. Um, it's very, very, very close. Actually, we have about three different scenarios that we're working through right now. And as I mentioned, we when we pick one of them, when we execute upon it, if we do, that would be right now at the top of our list. So it's like you've read my mind, Jason. Well, here's the room I'm going to here. give you another idea. What about an ICO per country? 
So you say, we're going to do the Serbia ICO, the Somalia ICO, and people then would be able to bet on each country and say, hey, there's 11 million people in Somalia. We're going to try to raise $10 per person to do this identity project, and it will go into a nonprofit. We're going to take 20% of it to run our for-profit. The other 80% is going to go for the next five years to get as many, or next 10 years, to get as many people online as possible and provide that infrastructure for free and places where people can go sign up to get their identity. What if you did an ICO per country? So you had aid tech, you know, Somalia ICO, Serbia ICO, then you could tap into local pools of capital and international pools of capital that want to bet on that country's future. Well, we've got the reach to do it, that's for sure. We've got the reputation right now. We've got the partners. That goes back to the business model. Mm. Um, and again, Jason, you really are. You're reading. You, it's like you've been listening into our conversations. Uh, or you've been in my you incubator. Know. But uh, <laughs> now You guys have yeah. done a great job in the incubator. Tell everybody, uh, as we wrap up here, what your thoughts are on how you've been able to accomplish so much while in the incubator and optimizing for the, an incubator-like experience. When you're yeah. a founder, you get into an incubator and you've got just a small amount of resources. Obviously, the incubator takes some of them. What are the best practices or things you've learned about leveraging uh, and who should go to an incubator, who shouldn't, and how to get the most out of it? A couple different questions. Yeah. Well, for us, then, uh, your incubator, I'm not saying this is, is phenomenal. So the thing that we, we struggled with initially, uh, being based out of Dublin, Ireland, we have an office in London, too, was that people in that part of the world, in Europe, and I've heard you speak about this in the podcast before, with the exception of Sweden, is that you know maybe people don't think quite as big as they would over here. So for us, coming to Silicon Valley, being on your, your incubator has been phenomenal. But in I, opening up maybe in your ambition. Up, yeah, for example, we spoke with already this week, and it's all thanks to you and the team at launch, Jackie, Jess, um, Ashley, everybody that we've met, Luke, Ashley, yeah, 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 Troy, they're phenomenal people in here. But I think it's down to your team. And we, we went through Techstars before. That was a phenomenal accelerator in London. But for us, really, uh, we we sped up uh, and we learned a huge amount. And I think a lot of the mistakes that we would have met, we would have made, we didn't make them because ah. of the incubator. And I think if you want to avoid making mistakes, which are part of the game, going through an incubator and learning yeah. from somebody like you and learning how to pitch. I met you back in April for the first time. I'd been listening to your podcast for years, but the way you described how to pitch the three the three rules that you have, is yeah. it three, isn't it? Four, but Four, yeah, so sorry, the, yeah, there's three that are important. Get to the product in 15 product, seconds yeah. is one that you don't. Synchronicity is incredibly important. Explain to people why synchronicity is important in a presentation. Synchronicity is very important because, again, if you think about the information that you're throwing at somebody, if you're throwing too much information at them, which we have been guilty of in the past. So I'll give you an example three years ago when we set the company up we talked about you know we are a blockchain company doing x and it was really tech focused but for us to get this message out there which we've been quite good at doing as evidenced by my co-founder joe being on a billboard in times square today yeah learning how to tell that story yeah and you sum it up really well and you describe it as telling it it's like a trailer like a trailer for a movie right. you want to get people interested and then when they re they see that trailer they want to learn more so and maybe spend two hours with you yeah so when you when you're doing that pitch yeah. Uh, being able to do a one to five minute pitch, pick a number of minutes, because sometimes the UN will give you three minutes, sometimes a conference will give you five, and sometimes you might just meet somebody walking down the street and have two minutes in a coffee shop with them. You've got to be able to tell that compelling story yeah. clearly and concisely, so they want to then come see your two-hour movie, three-hour movie, and yeah. dig deep into your company. And it's, it's like life, Jason. Uh, it's a sales game. Even when mm -hmm. I think about uh, my home life with my wife, uh, she's going to listen back to this, yeah. and she may, might not like me saying it, but it's a sales game, even yeah. at home, when you're in the startup world, to have you gotta, the survivability. Listen, you yeah. gotta con sometimes you got to convince your spouse to sacrifice <laughs> and take care of the, yeah, you do. the family or to sacrifice and not see you for two weeks while you're doing this. And uh, a lot of people who come to the incubator have to have that conversation with a spouse or a partner of whatever type uh, and say, hey, it's going to be 12 intense weeks, and there's 20 sessions, so... You're not going to see much of me, especially if I'm commuting in from Dublin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, listen, this has been amazing. Uh, it's a real. Um, it's been really great to be an investor in the company. Uh, I'm very bullish on it, and it. Uh, it's great to see the effort you put in. You know, not every idea is going to work, uh, and not every company is going to succeed. But what you do have control over is the effort you put in. Uh, and Joe and Niall have put in a tremendous amount of effort, and for that, they have my respect and investment. You can go check out more about aid technology at aid, A-I-D, dot technology. You got that doc technology domain name. And they're aid technology on Twitter. Uh, and Niall is uh, Dennehy, Niall, N-I-A-L-L, -L, whatever. You'll, you'll, you, you can uh, search for him on the Twitter. And continued success. And if you're in jasonsyndicate.com, you never know. Anything's possible. Maybe at some point we'll syndicate that deal. 
We'll see. Uh, but you've been doing very good with the investors. So you guys get, every week we score uh, how many votes you get from investors, and uh, you've been in the top three pretty regularly. So I believe overall, I think we may be number one, maybe two at the moment. I think you're two at the moment. Number two yeah, at the moment. Well, we've got to change that today then. Yeah, the maybe tonight. Will, well, uh, is today the night we're doing double session? We're doing double tonight, yeah. Oh boy, double time. <laughs> it's, it's a little exhausting, this incubator. I'm yeah. getting exhausted. I'm not in the program. I don't have to do any work. I just show up and listen and I'm getting tired. Is it too exhausting or is it just right? Uh, I think it's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. We've got to take the uh, jet lag into account, but as soon as we hop off the plane from uh, Dublin or London yeah. or even New York, uh, we just get this uh, crazy energy comes over us, and I think maybe we pick it up from you, Jason. <laughs> that might be it. <laughs> That's very kind of you, Niall. All right. Uh, thanks so much, and we'll be back with more. Mm -hmm.